everybody. Um, my name is Umesh Fazirani, and um, I'm the research director for quantum computing here at the Simons Institute. So uh, thanks, thank you everyone for joining for this science communicator in residence presentation. I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about the about this program. So. Uh, you know, the Science, Simons Institute uh, Science Communicator in Residence program uh, was created in fall 2016 with, I guess, dual goals of uh, increasing visibility of uh, theoretical computer science and also of su supporting science communicators uh, interested in covering the field. Um, so resident communicators uh, participate in the Institute's uh, research programs, uh, produce written and video content about the research taking place uh, at the Institute and train our participating scientists on how to communicate their work to a broad audience. So for, day, for today's uh, uh, event, it's, you know, we are really delighted to have our current science communicator in residence, Jordan uh, Ellenberg. So he, um, uh, you know, Jordan uh, is is sort of unique in the sense that he wears two hats. He's one of us uh, in, you know, actually. So he's a professor of mathematics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, specializing in number theory, algebraic geometry, with um, additional interest in combinatorics, topology, application of machine learning to pure math. And then, of course, he's also an accomplished uh, science communicator to a broad audience. He's the author of two popular books on mathematics, how not to be wrong, and shape, and uh, many articles in newspapers, magazines, etc. So um, he's, uh, of course, finishing his residency here this week, but, uh, but he's going to tell us today about outward uh, facing science. So please um, join me in welcoming, welcoming him here. Hi everybody, thanks Umesh and thanks um, to the Institute for having me here, which has been like a very uh, enlightening visit from which I'm learning a lot. I've talked to a lot of people. I hope some of you I haven't talked to, I'll get to talk to over the course of the next week, especially as uh, this AI and humanity conference gets underway. Um, this is gonna be kind of an experimental talk. I have never, I mean, I talk to people one-on-one -on -one about science communication a lot. And I think I have never tried to talk about it in a seminar form. So, uh, Let's see how it goes, but you should feel free to interrupt me. You know, I feel like the talks I've been to at this workshop, I feel like theoretical CS is like a little less of an interrupty culture and pure math is like a little bit more of an interrupty culture. So I'm used to people yelling stuff out like while I talk and you can, we can feel free to do it math style um, because I'm interested to know part of my ambit here, I think is like understanding what you guys wanna know um, about whatever expertise I've sort of accidentally gathered about science communication uh, over the years. So I'm just gonna talk about stuff and then let's see uh, where it goes. So, I mean, let's sort of talk about this catchphrase, outward facing science that I wanna kind of promote a little bit. I mean, okay, we complain a lot about the way the science we know is presented in the media. I bet everybody here has done that at some point or another. And I certainly have. And you know, there's there's what to complain about. Right? I mean, my friends who are the topologists, like they're just like the donut as a coffee cup people. And like number theorists like me are like the finding patterns in the primes people, right? That's what the world says that we do. And then maybe we're like compromising your credit card by finding a pattern in the primes or something like this. Um, for a lot of the people here who work in artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, I would guess, I mean, you could tell me what you think, that the level of popular caricature is even higher. Is that fair to, to say? I don't even know, what's, what's the equivalent? Like, what's the thing that is like the most goat getting that you feel like you always see? So, uh, but what you described was, was, a, was a focus on a very narrow part of the subject. But there's also distortion. You know, if, if I were to take what's, what's in the popular press, like one of the few I would sort of say, maybe I don't know the subject at all. And, um, and, and if I were to judge the popular media by what they say about quantum computing, I would, I would actually doubt everything else I read. <laughs> Maybe you should though. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, we have this experience of like talking to the, I mean, so, right, so, so it's not even just like that somebody's writing something and they sort of 
read and sort of what they convey doesn't really track what we know. It's that even when in articles that where we appear and are quoted, still somehow we're not so happy about the way things come out. So what I mean, but you know, why don't journalists talk about science as it really is? Because they don't necessarily know how it really is. Like that's not their job. They have a different profession. And if we want to add something to the public discourse about science, I think there's no real alternative to at least part of it being us telling our own stories. That's what I mean by outward facing science, like us talking to the public, not through the conduit of a professional journalist, but, um, but ourselves. Um, that's what I mean by outward facing science. And it's something that over the years, I sort of accidentally have learned how to do like over a long period of time um, and know something about, and now I'm sort of trying to share some of that information. And so what I wanna say, I mean, so what does that look like in practice, right? It's nice to say, but what does it actually look like? Let me draw a picture of the way I think about it because I think there's a lot of ways that we scientists convey information. And there's kind of like, the way I like to think of it is that there's a big curve that looks like this where the axes are, um, I planned this board very badly, didn't I? Okay, well, um, I'll label this axis here. This is um, what we can ask of our audience, whether that's in terms of amount of time or energy or attention or whatever. And then this is like, um, number of people reach. So the reach and the size of the ask are kind of inversely related to each other. And um, a lot of what we do as science communicators uh, is somewhere on this curve. And indeed something that probably all of us do if we're academics is we teach in the classroom, right? And that is, by the way, an essential part of our role as science communicators. And I think that one way I like to think about all this kind of stuff that I and other people do is sort of as an extension of what we do in the classroom. It's, a, it's at a different point in the curve, but it's the same kind of thing. So the classroom is like maybe over here. Where you're talking to 20 or 50 or 100 or the CS professors, I guess, are teaching like 500 now, right? Like the giant uh, intro CS classes, but sort of that order of magnitude of people. Um, oh, I messed it up. I knew I was going to do this. It's really more like over here, right? Few people reached, or you can all just turn your heads 90 degrees. Um, fairly few people reached, but we can ask a lot, right? We can assign homework and have tests and they're with us for a whole semester. Um, actually, I would put it, the terminus of this curve is really, I, I like to put even like PhD advising, that's one person. But you really get a lot, right? I mean, you can ask for a lot of their time and like you're together for a period of years. And that's sort of what I consider. And then, you know, over here is like um, something like national TV, something that like very few of us get to do. Um, but if you do it, I've done it like a couple of times. Maybe you get 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds. Like that's what you get. And that's what you have to offer. But the reach is incredible. Um, and then maybe, and then there's like a sort of huge range, right? I mean, there's, I guess, um, I don't know if there's such a thing as a viral science TikTok star. There is such a thing as math talk. I've seen it. You get a little bit longer than you get on TV and probably you don't get as much of a reach. TV is still really big. Yes, I. I think you, what's missing here is not just the number of people you reach, but how much of the content that they perceive is the content that you wanted to convey. That's true, but to a first approximation, I feel like in some sense, if we're like delivering like a certain amount of content per second, like there's there's some first order where like the longer we have with them, the more we can convey. And I also think that the more attention and time you have, like the more you can refine your statement and sort of make it closer to what you want to. Actually, I'm going to say something about this in a minute, but I mean, it's um, all right. So these are the ends, and then replace um. There's like lots of stuff in between here, but I, I sort of want to talk about like maybe um, articles in the national press are here. Um, 
books are maybe here. A book takes a little bit longer to read and like probably unless you're John Grisham or something like that, like it's not gonna be seen by as many people as might see, be seen by an article in, in a major paper. Um, but they're kind of in this middle ground. Um, that doesn't mean they're the most important part of outward facing science, but it's the part that I know a lot about. So I'm gonna kind of focus on that in today's talk. But I think actually the stuff that's in here, like the people who are doing YouTube stuff and the people who are doing, which is like a little bit shorter and less content, but is, I mean, or, or podcasts or like all that stuff is in here. And actually I would love, I mean, if we wanna talk about that, we can talk about that too. I don't know much, but I mean, maybe, maybe uh, some of you know more. Um, so, by the way, it may look like I'm checking my email, but I just have my notes on my phone because I'm trying not to like print so much stuff out unnecessarily. Um, so these are my notes. Um, I talked to a lot of people who are interested in this, like a lot, especially younger scientists, um, graduate students and postdocs. And, you know, with, with like the energy of not having your life like already kind of set out and you sort of already, you know, at my age, you kind of know what kind of things you do. And the early career scientists are more like figuring out those questions. So a lot of people, like I can, I can know just from talking to people that there's, I'm not making this desire up that like a lot of people, maybe even some of you, since you've chosen to be in this room with me today, um, are interested in telling your own story. So let me start with a couple of questions that I'm often asked. Number one question that I am always asked is just, is this actually compatible with moving forward in my scientific career? Or would I be like screwing myself over to devote any energy and time to this. And here I can sort of emphatically say yes. Um, it is completely compatible with an academic career because the truth is that what did that look like for me and what might it look like for somebody else? It looked like when I was like a graduate student and a postdoc and even an, a pre-tenure professor, I would write maybe two to four articles a year. That's actually not a huge commitment. An article, of course, is not like an article like we write for science, an article is like maybe a thousand words long, like three pages. It's not actually a huge commitment. Um, and that's definitely enough to feel like you're doing something and to sort of build up um, a repertoire of stuff. Of course, if your goal was to have a career as a writer, that would not be enough. So I'm talking about for those of us who's like, our career is this. We're here, we're writing papers, if we're mathematicians, we're proving theorems, if we're engineers, we're developing systems. Um, does this work as a thing to do on the side? It completely does. I mean, and if I'm honest, for most of us, certainly for me, and I think for most people, um, do you have two or more than two to four things like you really need to say to the public every year? Like maybe, maybe not, like maybe that's enough. I mean, Look, let me put it this way. If you're a professional writer, like look at the people whose job it is, they're like once a week, they gotta have an opinion in the New York Times. Don't you always feel like they have like more pieces they have to write than interesting opinions that they actually have? And there's like a lot of recycling, right? So we don't, what's great for us is that we don't have to be that person, right? We're, our job is doing science um, and our side thing is communicating. And that means that we only have to write about what we wanna write about like something that actually needs to be said. And I think writing at that level is extremely compatible uh, with, well, I, I always like to hedge myself. I should say with an academic career. Now, I would actually be very curious, are there people in the room who are in industry and can speak to that? Because I know we have like lots of people participating in the conferences who work for companies. Any thoughts on this? Because I feel like I always give this advice, but I mostly know like people who are like assistant professors. Okay, let's hold the thought. We don't know. Yeah, Matt. So, so you know, you, you have this trade-off, and I was thinking about something slightly different. You know, uh, and I, I was curious where you would place it on this on this uh, on this curve. So. You know, blog like say Scott Aronson's blog. Where, where would you place that, and you know, what, what role does it play? Oh yeah, that's great because that's a key part of the ecosystem. And I would put it. Um, I would put. Let, let's give him his own dot. <laughs> I mean, this, Scott is going to be a stand-in for like <laughs> Scott-like individuals. <laughs> Maybe there are no Scott. Okay, anyway, the. Um, 
<laughs> but yeah, for those who don't know him, like he writes um, a blog with like a lot of really interesting stuff about not just quantum computation, although that's sort of his research area. Um, and I would say, um, maybe I should put him a little bit closer to books. Because the books itself has like a very wide range depending on what the book is like and just like commercial factors that you can't control of like, there is a whole spectrum there. There's Gil Kalai, there's Luca, there's uh, people. Yeah, let's put them all in. Good idea. I'm putting Gil, okay, and uh, and Luca, right? I don't want to make it all about Scott. Um, and, and let's books to be, we're just going to keep on decorating this thing. Books is, books is the spectrum that should actually include this stuff, right? Because books have a wider. But I would say, in general, I mean, you can tell me what you think, but I would say for all of those. The blogs we named, Gil's blog, Lucas' blog, and Scott's blog. Maybe Terry Cox. <laughs> and Terry, absolutely, if we're going to incorporate pure math and other stuff. Um, it's, it's certainly not the same as like the Washington Post, New York Times, Atlantic, Slate kind of audience, right? It's more technical than that. It's a smaller slice. Um, but you can do more, right? Scott's posts are a lot longer than an opinion piece. In, the newspaper. Okay, so I guess you're saying there's like a little bit of a off curve question in that those are shorter, but maybe aimed a little more technical on a smaller route. Okay, so I guess it's not a purely one dimensional secret cloud. Uh, yeah, Jake. Uh, um, you frame this in terms of perhaps like the compatibility of this kind of communication with an academic career. Perhaps there's also um, uh, a way to think about it as there's kind of an imperative to participate in this as part of an academic career as well, because uh, I don't know how it works in various disciplines, but of course there's this imperative and in different countries, of course, towards things like impact, which uh, in some disciplines may be primarily uh, defined through things like citation counts, but might be more qualitative qualitatively assessed in other disciplines where communication to the public and maybe the take up of that kind of communication in policy or, or judicial worlds is, is, is highly, highly valued. And so maybe like there's a complicating factor in your curve that's like, yes, this, this might be compatible, but this might be like imperative. And then what, what, what does that say about the actual purpose of the communication? Because you might even put like Twitter Right on your on your curve, which oh yeah, I do that. I should put it on. Which um, is you know partially about communicating things, but also very much about self promotion. And so there's something there's like yeah, communication versus like self promotion and its relationship to institutional imperatives maybe complicates the future of them. Yeah, I feel like where you put Twitter and TikTok relatively on the curve is like basically a function of your age, right? I'm like oh, Twitter obviously much bigger, but probably not really anyway. Yeah, so this is okay. That was some really interesting stuff with a lot in it. Some of which links with something I'm about to say, some of which doesn't, and I want to speak to it. First of all, I want to say something interestingly, I thought you were gonna go in a different direction with the first thing you said. When you said, like, well, to what extent is it imperative? I kind of thought you were gonna say, like, to what extent is it a moral imperative? And we may feel just internally like it's important for people to know, but I think you meant more like an imperative in the sense that something like your classroom teaching that is actually considered like part of your Absolutely. job. So, right, because like, this is a good example of something that most of us don't get to pick whether we do it or not. Like, we just are going to do it. And the only question is whether to do it well or poorly. Um, here's what I would say the part that was going to link up with something I, I was going to say but forgot to, which is like in terms of people's anxieties about will this mess with my career, is that just as you say, um, writing for the public sort of translates into impact. And like, how many of you guys have written an NSF proposal already? But it's just something I'm not understanding. It's like, like not your NRC. Yeah. Wait, do computer scientists not write NSF proposals? Okay. Um, right. So you know that there's like a broader impact section, and this stuff definitely counts. So it is, I mean, I but I wouldn't say it's an imperative because nobody makes you have that particular kind of impact. So I would but I would say it's definitely rewarded. I would say it definitely, so to speak, counts. But that kind of impact, it doesn't, people who are in the institution don't care if people get the right message, they just want the numbers. Yeah, <laughs> it's just really and I mean, fast. there's, you know, it, it totally depends, but there's like these research excellence frameworks that are national sort of evaluation systematics in the UK and Australia, 
that include like impact as criteria for funding nationally and things like that. Well, so you're saying it's like less loosey goosey than in the United States, where like mm -hmm. if you do it great and you can get credit for it, but nobody's Maybe. looking over your shoulder. It's hard to know, but yeah. Actually, this is really interesting because it's true that as an American, I look at everything through an extremely myopic American lens. And so everything I say is kind of like this is how it works in American academia and American media. And you should always like preface it because I'm realizing that there's a lot I don't know. Well, you know, America, from what, you know, my, my my internalization of it managed to avoid some of the like national accountability stuff that happened in the 80s and 90s because the institutions were in some of the institutions were wealthy enough to resist like the need to demonstrate value for money in terms of research funding. Uh, but that's, you know, so that that means impact means a certain thing and is perhaps also more about uh, achieving profile for individual researchers such that they can get jobs because it's more competitive versus UK, Australia, for instance, where impact is part of the next evaluation framework. I see. So yeah, it's definitely true that in the United States, I think it certainly is like helpful for your grant applications, but no one, at least for a young American academic, nobody at your job is expecting you to do it. But I think what I have all, another question I'm often asked is like, will the people at my job, the senior people in my department, the people deciding my tenure, will it be seen as a negative? Like I'm not serious. And there I would say, no, not in the US academic context. But that's really interesting. I mean, for instance, in England, I know that um, Marcus Dusanto, who I know well, I mean, he is a professor of like this. In America, we don't have that. It's, it's like less institutionalized. There's no such thing as being a professor of, I forgot exactly what his title was, but he's like literally a professor of talking about mathematics in public. Um, and we don't have, I don't know if that exists in Australia as a fellowship, but it doesn't exist in the US. Um, okay, sorry, I'm just pulling up my notes. Um, yes, um, so compatible with it in certain ways, like helpful to, and I guess in certain national aspects, like maybe even sort of an expected part of, an academic career. It's the kind of thing like a lot of things we do in science that um, the more you do it, the faster you get at it. So it sort of becomes like a easier and easier go to the point of that now, if I have an idea for a thousand word piece, that's like an afternoon of work for me. It certainly was not when I started, but now it's something that I can like roll out pretty magazine ready copy um, in that amount of time. And that just takes like time and experience. Um, the other thing I do, by the way, is book writing. That's sort of a different story and it involves a certain like level of focused commitment that i think is um like i didn't do this until i already had tenure and i'm not sure i would recommend it to like one of my mentees sometimes when people have a book in them they can't stop themselves but i mean i would i would i would, I would maybe say this is like a later career thing to try to do although um but okay these are generalities but i want to get even more specific i want to talk about something new that I did this past semester, um, which is that, okay, so I didn't say my own story is that I was a math major in college, but I was always really interested in writing, and I went off to do uh, a creative writing degree for a year. So I spent a year just like hanging out with writers and like, um, and I'd been going to like a lot of workshops and well, that life was not for me. It has, the life has many flaws. <laughs> of a writer of, of literary fiction. But um, one thing I, I sort of came to, I, I guess what I'm saying is like, when I think about what good science writing is, and now we're focusing in on like the written word as a means of communication. Fundamentally, I think good science writing is good writing. I think the things that make an article about our science effective, of course it should be accurate, right? Of course it should tell the story we want to tell, but that's in some ways kind of a low bar to clear. We have to write something people want to read. And for that, I think the sort of virtues of that make science writing good are, are not so different from what makes an opinion piece about anything else good, or for that matter, what makes a short story good. So an experiment I wanted to do, and I wanted to do it for a long time, and I finally did it this spring, was to run a writer's workshop for scientists that would basically like run along the same goal as um, the way creative writing workshops work for people who want to be novelists or short story writers, running in that same format uh, to see if it works. And what that means, I don't know, has anybody in the room taken a creative writing course or like done a, okay, like one, 
yeah, it's not that common. They're pretty popular courses at Wisconsin, probably at most US universities. Um, so what that meant, and I wanted to do it this semester because I felt like I didn't want to restrict it to Wisconsin. And I felt like probably spring 2022 was like the last semester people were going to be willing to do a Zoom class. I was like, I probably can't get away with it like any time later than this. And I wanted to do it kind of globally. So, um, so we got together over the course of the spring. Um, and, um, and the way a workshop works is just like everybody submits a draft of a piece. And then for each piece, we just spend the entire hour going through it and talking about both how it's working globally, but also like individual words and sentences. And that's pretty deep. An hour is actually like a long time to talk about a three page document. And the truth is like, we could have gone longer. I would say every week we could have gone longer, but even so an hour is a lot of time to spend and it really allows you to go pretty deep. And so I, I'm gonna take the rest of our time together, which is not, not that long. Um, and again, people should feel free to jump in. Um, just to say some stuff that I learned from this workshop, because even though I've been doing this kind of thing for a long time, it really helped sharpen my own thinking about like, especially for like novices, like what is it uh, that makes a short science piece work? And also sort of, to be honest, what habits do we have to unlearn that like make sense in our usual academic writing, but that don't actually make sense uh, in this context? I think over time, I've kind of learned to what, you know, what they, what they call code switch. Like, I don't really think about it. If I sit down to write something that's not academic, I sort of instantly slip into that different register. But for most of us, like most of our experience writing is in writing papers or at most writing grant proposals. And those are written in a very different register. It's just different. So the first thing I'd say, this is probably the most important takeaway, um, which is simply this, that in anything you write, you just ask every single word individually what work it's doing. And then you take out the words that aren't doing any work. That sounds like very simple, but it's actually, we're not, we, I mean, okay, there's probably people here who do NLP and are gonna laugh at me for saying this, but I feel like we kind of look at sentences and even paragraphs as like big chunks. We're not sort of, it doesn't come natural to us to like look at every single word. But I think as a writer, you do actually have to train yourself to do that. Um, let me give an example. This is actually, a lot of my students were, ML people. So some of the examples will be those kind of examples. Hey, Imagine, do you want to ask something? You look like you're half raising your hand. Uh, you know, I, okay, so maybe before we get, I, I just had a thought before we get to the words. But, yeah. Uh, you know, so if you, if you ever write a, an article for science or nature, you go through a certain kind of thinking, you know, the map, you know, so you, you go through a certain kind of thinking where you say, okay, I want to write this article, but, but is it of interest to anybody? And what aspect is most interesting? You know, why would it be interesting to a, to a, to a wide science audience? And then, you know, so there's there's a there's a process that one goes through, and and by the time you're done with it, um, you know, you're still talking about the same results, but but uh, but maybe from a very different perspective, or or highlighting very different uh, parts of it. So. So I, I, I was curious in, in this particular uh, exercise you did, you know, was there this stretching of certain parts and shrinking of others or changing of perspective and so on? This is a great question. It speaks to something. What I'm going to say about this, it might be a little idiosyncratic to me and not everybody would agree with it because it's natural to approach this and be like, well, how can I make this interesting to other people, right? What are they, the public, the audience interested in? How can I sort of like, change my vision so it's interesting to them. I don't actually see it that way. Um, yeah, but that's not what I meant either. Oh, okay. I was trying to say that. No, yeah, I was but... trying to say, not that, not that um, how do I take this and move it to where it is, but how do, I, how do I take what I've done and actually explore it from different viewpoints until I find something that's really fundamental there, you know, which, is, which, was, which I had not put my finger on before. I see. I mean, I guess what I would say, there's, there's a tension, there's a tension because you want to sort of, as you say, sort of break out of like your customary way of seeing things. At the same time, in the end, I think it's okay, like to see it from your own, to see it from your own viewpoint in the following sense. Like I feel like, I mean, it is kind of sort of similar to like when we're in the classroom teaching calculus or teaching anything else that we teach um, that 
you have to like locate your own excitement and be in touch with it and convey that. Like I think it's important, and maybe this is this is like really like third bullet point, but maybe I'll just like say it first that sometimes in academic writing, maybe always, we're trained to kind of be a sort of objective like voice from nowhere. Like that's the style. Like, even in math, right? We don't say I in our papers. Do you guys do that in CS? Like we say we, as if we're speaking for sort of some like mass of vaguely human thinking entities, but definitely not like I myself. I'm not supposed to be like present in my theorem. Um, in writing for the public, it's exactly the opposite. I think you do need to be there, like not like a lot, like you don't need to sort of like describe what you were eating as you like thought about this project. But I mean, um, there should be some sense that there's like another human being who is telling you this. And like part of that is like, um, if you're excited about something, like I think you can convey that. And actually, if you're not, I think then it's very hard to do a good job. Even if objectively you're like, this is important. If you're not, if you don't personally have the feeling, I think it's extremely hard. Maybe it's like a level of writing higher than I know how to attain to like make what's on the page be exciting. If that if that makes sense. But I do think you're but you're right. That's a little bit of a long line, sort of a little bit use your question as a jumping off point. In that. I think it's true um, that. trying to break out of the way you would ordinarily talk about it can be like valuable, not just for being able to explain it, but for actually yourself sort of like understanding things from a perspective you have understood. Um, I think actually participating in an exercise like the one that we did with the workshop can be part of that because one way to sort of get to the viewpoint is to literally be like, okay, the eight of us are gonna sit in a, in a room, whether it's Zoom or, or real, and really think about this thing that I wrote and we kind of all agree to share our time with each other in that way so that one week it's my week. And that's like a very direct and visceral way to kind of see what you said from the outside. Uh, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I was just gonna give a, a short example to sort of say what I mean about this first uh, point, right? So here's the sentence that came up. I asked my student permission to use the sentence. Um, uh, you can't really, I'm trying to remember what, so this is, this, this is actually great for the AI and humanity people because it's a topic, I don't remember what particular model this article was about, but uh, you can't really escape uh, the proliferation Of these models in your everyday life. There's a lot of models about which you could imagine saying this, right? People in the AI and humanity section. But, and this is like a perfectly good, I would say this is written in a conversational register. But if we actually look at it and like look at each word and ask what we're doing, this is the kind of exercise like I sort of try to get us to do in a workshop like this. Um, First of all, um, really is not really doing anything. Really is sort of like a soft version of, sometimes it means kind of like very, it's like kind of an intensifier, but it doesn't add much semantic to this sentence. It's, it's, a, it's something we say in conversation to sort of soften what we're saying, to hedge. And there's often no need to do this in writing. So I'm gonna cut it. Um, by the way, sometimes it may seem, sometimes, we talk about this in the workshop a lot too, that there are of course no rules. So I'm not gonna say like the word really can never be used. Of course, sometimes it can, it's just that it's often used in this kind of soft way where it's not doing much and we just have to like um, get rid of it. Okay, so we can't escape the proliferation of these models. You can't really escape the proliferation of these models in your everyday life. By the way, one thing I like about this sentence I'll say is that, um, I said it's important for it to feel like the author is present in the piece. It's also generally a good idea for the reader to feel present in the piece. So this kind of language is actually like pretty good, I feel. And we wouldn't do it in a paper, right? You would never write this in a paper, but I think this, uh, you might say it's a trick, but it's more just like a, a normal part of the way that one human being communicates with another. And so I think this tends to sort of be strong. So I like this you, we're gonna leave that in. Um, but. 
what is it that you're escaping? You're not really escaping the sort of rapid growth and regeneration of the models. You're really escaping the models themselves. In other words, we're sort of saying, this sentence is trying to do two things at once. It's trying to say, we're escaping the models, but then also that they're proliferating quickly. But I think it's syntactically a bit confused. And I think we should just cut. If we want to say the models are like, there's, if we want to say there's like more and more of them, we can do that somewhere else. But somehow this is like saying something that's not really what we mean to say. It's not the proliferation we're escaping, it's the models we're escaping. Okay, and then finally, um, actually like, what's going on with, like, where are you while you're trying to escape these models? I mean, I guess you're in your everyday life, but like, really, where else would you be? Like, what does this actually tell you about what's happening? Like, that, that it talks about, not just about your, uh, well, not just about your academic research. Right, but then there should be an example. This is too vague. We can have another sentence where, and there should be, where there's a thing in your life that the models affect. But this, I would like literally just cut and then do an example. You can't escape these models, is what this sentence really says. And like, that's sort of an extreme example, but I feel like almost everything you write you can go through and let's say like, literally cut out about 20% of the words. And doing this like is an, an immensely useful exercise because you'll see that what's left is just kind of snappier and sharper and moves faster. And I don't know, it feels like less sludgy somehow. So we did like a ton of this. I mean, this is that we, we try to train ourselves to kind of all uh, do it to each other's work. Um, and in academic writing, I think we don't, tend to have this as a value, right? I mean, and for good reason, it's not so important, but I mean, we don't tend to be like, is every single word super functional? Um, you know, I'll make another couple of points and then we'll just sort of take questions and discuss. Um, okay, actually, I want to do it in a different order. Oh yeah, okay, I have another similar, this, is, this, this will be the board where we sort of attack individual sentences. So here's one that was, uh, I abstracted from a student's paper. Um, one might consider, and now I forgot what the actual things were in the sentence, so I'm just going to like put variables in, x, be a form of y. This is a kind of a sentence you can imagine writing or reading or seeing like in a paper, but if we take a moment to like look at what it's doing, this is sort of what I mean when I talk about this voice from nowhere that we like to use in academic writing. Because what am I really saying? I'm saying I consider X to be a form of Y, but that's a little, seems a little aggressive. I don't want to say that. So I'm just going to say some impersonal one is saying that, but I'm not even saying that, right? That's even still sort of seems too forceful. So I'm, just, I'm not saying one does consider it. I'm saying one might in some counterfactual world, like maybe give oneself permission, whoever one is to do that. Um, yeah, that's like natural academic speak, but it's like not natural for writing for a general audience. This is like too distant and it takes us away. It makes us not present. Like the author, want, the reader wants us to say something. Yeah. Unless you want to follow this up with like, however, this is limiting for so, so reason. In which case you're attacking this broad viewpoint that some might consider. That is a great point, right? So sometimes you raise, uh, right there, what's that great seminar by Jean-Pierre Serre, the famous number theorist, who sort of, he's like, okay, we introduced the notation like so-and-so. And then he's like, I introduced this notation only in order to object to it. <laughs> and then he moved on with his own notation. So, so that's, okay, so actually that speaks to another one of my bullet points, which maybe I'll sort of say now. Another thing that's very natural for us to do in academic writing, sometimes because a referee has asked us to, is to sort of in our writing, sort of anticipate alternate or even opposing views and address them. Um, there are times when you want to do that in popular writing, but it's a little bit rare. And so usually I would say, um, like your readers are not gonna approach your thing anticipating, thinking about like every possible objection 
there could be. Sometimes there really is an obvious objection that you have to address, but often it just seems like very fussy if there's like multiple uh, one byte. So let's let's just say that in the context, this was not written this way. This was written as the person was going to endorse this view, uh, and then you know you can just say, oh, you might probably, probably can't see it if I write down here, right? Is this too far? Is this too low? Okay. Was this already too low? You can see it on there. See it on oh. Okay. So let me, okay, we're going to go over here. So alternates for this, you could say, um, let's put you in there. You can think of X as a Y. That's much faster. And it says the same thing. It, it, you might really need a form of, but usually you don't. It just depends on the context. But probably, or even, by the way, Here's another option, just think of X as a Y. This is like the exact opposite end of the pole where here we write it in this kind of funny impersonal way because we're like, oh, I don't wanna be seen as like telling you what to think. And here, like you're really sort of adopting the, what is this called? There's a the something mood, the imperative mood, right? Where I, the author, am actually sort of telling you what to think. And sometimes we are doing that. So, I mean, depending on the tone, depending on the overall thing, I think either of these uh, can work. And they're both snappier than, than something like this, which just comes naturally to our hand uh, from academic writing. Um, let me say one global thing, and then I'll sort of Oh yeah, one more thing. Maybe I won't write this one on the board. I'll just read it out loud. This was one. Um, this was an, another ML paper. Um, one of my students wrote, "This translation function is built using a technique called con contrastive language image pretraining, which has been perfected and fine-tuned by many different researchers in recent years." Okay, so in academic writing, credit is very important, right? One thing we really do not want to do is like neglect to cite people that we should cite. And this is one area I want to bring it up because it's it's an area where there is a real conflict between our values as academics and the way popular publications work is that if if you want to write a story about a scientific advance where like 12 people were like involved in a meaningful way, um, they're not going to let you put 12 names in the piece somehow. I mean, this is a constant source of conflict and I don't actually have a good answer to how to deal with it because I understand why we want to give everybody credit. And I can also tell you that in practice, the editor is going to say like, make it about one person, right? Like we want to talk about the model of sort of, I mean, I don't know quite how to fight this, but it's absolutely true that the popular model of science is like a person did something and they're going to want to have you focus on that person. That said, this thing I just read you, I think falls in this kind of uncanny valley that you want to avoid where it says, where we, I mean, we do write stuff like this in our papers, which has been perfected and fine-tuned by many different researchers in recent years. All that says is like people worked on it. It doesn't even name them. It's not even doing the work of giving, giving the credit. So I feel like there was like a lot of stuff like that that we sort of naturally write that can just, um, that can just be cut. Um, so just to say, let me say one kind of global thing I've said, yeah. It sounds more like. Um, I should ask, by the way, when you ask a question, I would love it if you would like tell me who you are, because then I can sort of to learn. Like, I didn't learn your name. I'm bot. You're bot. 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 Got it. Okay. I'm Neil. Neil. Yeah, that actually it reads to me more like um, maybe a lack of confidence. So you're trying to just justify what your claim is by saying a lot of people are thinking about it. It doesn't matter who they are. I'm just going to tell you they're credible researchers to give myself or to give my prior statement a little bit more lift uh, in terms of credibility. And maybe the point is that you actually want to find a way to give yourself that credibility naturally. Yeah, that's a great point that, that sometimes what looks like when you write thinking you're bolstering your credibility diminishes it because it's so unspecific. It's like, right, exactly. it's a little bit like Trumpian, like many people are saying, right? A very common yeah, you can use that just strong phrase. Like it's, I mean, yeah. you know, who, who is, you know, it doesn't matter. If, if they really are, tell me who they are. You know, so I know if they're people I trust or not, you know? Right. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so one just global thing I want to say that is that 
a short article, a thousand words is not very long. And so I think one of the biggest challenges, you know, as academics, we want to we want to be completist in our writing. We want to sort of explain everything. Um, a thousand word piece, really, there's room for one idea in it. Maybe one idea with like a gesture at a second. And so I think one of the things that we constantly had to do looking at these pieces are say is say. This is a great piece and it's trying to do three things because you have three important points you want to make. And you just got to write three articles Like you can't do it. And like, it's just, it is actually a lot like teaching. If we like, we may say, well, it's just imperative that I cover like all three of these topics and I have a week left in class. Well, guess what? Then you're going to cover zero of the topics, right? You may feel like you covered it because you said all the words, but in fact, it doesn't work. And I think like the short, uh, the short opinion piece is like that too. Like much as it comes natural to us, we have a lot of knowledge. We have a lot to say. We want to say it all. You do kind of have to pick one thing and be like, what is the idea of this piece? And if I get in and out having done that, then it's a success. Um, that also means that sometimes we have to be selective about what we write about. I mean, some, I mean, because you may say, well, like, look, there's some scientific topics, some advances, some pieces of news that are simply irreducibly complex. And I can't really boil it down to one idea. Those might not be the right things to write about in that format. Sometimes the subject has to choose the format. I mean, for me, for instance, I mean, there's a whole other story, but like I write a lot about legislative redistricting and I have written like thousand word newspaper pieces about that. And each time there was like a lot that went unsaid and I found myself frustrated by the fact that there really wasn't I was able to say one thing about it, but there's like many things to say. And so that in the end, I had to like put in the book and be like, it needs like 70 pages. It doesn't need a whole book about it, but it needs like a 70 page treatment. And in that case, I think, I just think that the, the subject itself like determined the format. Um, okay, that's a lot of stuff. Um, so let me close just by saying, I'll remind myself what it is that I want to close with. Um, Sometimes from by like going around and talking about outward facing science and running workshops like this. And my desire, by the way, I mean, this is my overall plan. I will I would like there to be more workshops like this, not done by me, because I think that there are a lot of students who are interested in learning this stuff. And I think like a lot can be done just by groups of people self-organizing and reading each other's work carefully and reflectively and looking at every word. I don't think there needs to be a so to speak expert in the room for this to work. So part of the reason I'm talking to you guys about this is because I'm sort of hoping that people will be like, oh, this seems like a good idea. Like, why don't we have this at our home institution? Um, but the end goal, at least from my point of view, even though I started by saying, we all like to complain about science journalism and what we see in the newspaper when reporters interview us or interview our friends or don't interview us or whatever it may be. Um, I, my goal is not to replace science journalism. My goal is to add to it. I do think we need to be able to tell our stories, like those of us who want to, those of us who have an interest, whether it's in a written format or a video format or a blog format or whatever else. Um, but I also think that um, there's a role for actual reporting, especially where science intersects policy. There's certainly, there's a lot of stuff that I am definitely not equipped to do, right? I mean, if you wanna write about policy and you want like, you need to know how to get a government official to tell you something about what's happening or how to find out what's happening if the government official won't tell you. That actually requires special skills, just like our stuff requires specialized skills um, that we don't have and we shouldn't really try to do, probably. So um, I see this work as something to complement the, um, the pretty incredible edifice of science journalism, which actually is growing like a lot and there's lots of room for it um, that already exists. Um, so I'm gonna just gonna stop there and take any more questions that there are. Thank you guys so much for so many people like coming to this. Yeah, Bob. Uh, so uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, one point I had uh, to ask your opinion about was what you mentioned towards the end of the talk. Uh, there is uh, editors have uh, they they like to attribute uh, contributions to one person. Uh, which is uh, kind of not a very academic way of writing about things. But it's also not a very honest way of uh, portraying uh, the, or attributing contributions that people have made. Uh, so 
how do you reconcile with that and how, how can we change uh, the way this is done uh, because presumably uh, editors are uh, space constrained uh, for whatever reason but yeah, but if I'm honest with you, I don't think it's about the space constraints. I think it's about their view of like what works as a narrative. So the, you're, you can probably tell from my tone of voice when I brought it up. This is one of the hardest ones for me because it's there's lots of places where there's a tension between the academic way and the journalistic way. And I'm just like, well, if you're in Rome, you eat your pork one way. And if you're in Paris, you eat your pork a different way. This I actually kind of think we're right about. And so it's like a little harder for me because I sort of don't necessarily want to acculturate to the um, I actually think it's sort of a, the, the, the stereotype of heroic science where like everything important like springs from one individual mind is kind of like bad for science so it's worth pushing back against. Um, I don't know, actually probably useful for those people who do like machine learning. I mean, at first, I mean, you know, I wrote, a, I wrote a, this one of the first long pieces I ever wrote was about compressed sensing during the heyday of compressed sensing for Wired magazine. And it was like really hard. I mean, they really wanted it to be like the Candace Tao show. And I love Emmanuel and I love Terry, but they're not the only people who work on it. But I was definitely kind of made, I think I wasn't even really, I don't remember whether I was allowed to put anybody else's name in it, but they definitely were like already two people is a lot. They were paper together, so it was sort of okay. But I, I remember that tension being like really difficult. And, and because it's not, right? It's not, there's, there's nothing bad, very little is that important in our field is like really springs from the mind of like a single person or a single group. Uh, yeah, Mesh. Yeah, so actually a comment on, on that and then I, I want to say something else. So the comment on that, uh, that I, or on activation that I, I've seen work well in, in, in stories is, uh, is where the person involved says, no, I didn't do all that. There was, a, there was an existing field. Or something, something that that softens it, and then then it comes across nicely because the person is saying it themselves. They are they are acknowledging that they were not they, they didn't do this alone. There were lots of other people. So so, so that's just one thing. But I, I wanted to make a, a different comment, uh, which was which was the following that you know when when we try to uh, try to uh, place our own work within within a scientific context, you know within. Uh, general articles or conscious articles or <coughs> publications. One one way we can view it is that you know we are we are trying to connect what we've done to the to the intellectual blockchain of, of our fields and saying where does it connect? You know how low is the form of our complexity of what we have? So how significant is it uh, within that within that uh, within, within that? And you know to to some extent. You know, when I was talking about the, you know, the science nature article, that that was the, you know, that was the sense of it that you you really try to think about what you've done and see where does it connect uh, naturally. But now it seems to me that there's there's also uh, there's also a, a, a popular culture meme uh, uh, blockchain, right? And and you can sort of say. Where does what you're doing connect to it? You know, so for instance, by the way, I can be honest with you and say I don't actually know what the blockchain is, so probably oh, all okay, of you guys okay. do. So I'm not sure I'm not understanding the metaphor. Oh, okay, so completely. just but... just metaphorically, I'm okay. saying that you know you want you want to connect up to uh, whatever the existing you know. So so if you're doing uh, if you're writing in, uh, in physics or math or theoretical computer science, you're sort of saying, yeah, the big ideas now. Do I connect to any of those? Uh, is this is this a uh, is what I'm what I'm talking about? Is it is it related to one of those, or is it on this branch? Or what's you know what level of branching do you have to go out to before you can place this particular advance or article or something? This idea, you know, where does it where does it connect up? And what's the you know what's the what's the thickest branch if you want that it connects? With? That, that, you know, so so you could sort of ask the same question about what you're what you're writing about in the popular press and and. You know, there's sort of this notion that, well, physicists have it great because, you know, things connect to, you know, what's what's the nature of our physical reality, or you know, you know, black holes, or or outer space, or you know, what are the building blocks of our of of uh, space time, whatever, right? So, so it seems really fundamental, and and you connect to that, and everybody's interested in reading about it, you know, because because it seems like uh, it's so important, and then then the question is that. You know, uh, you know where does, does it, you know? So, 
So what what is you know what is this thing that you're trying to connect to and what's its nature? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's actually, that's a goal. I mean, that, that is in a way in tension with the thing I said about that in a short article, it kind of has to be about one thing because then what makes it hard is like, how do you contextualize it? And that really takes some delicacy. I mean, I think often you kind of have to do that in like a sentence or two at the beginning. You have to do it very fast, right? Because if you did it at the length that we're used to doing it academically, the article would already be over, right? If you were like, really put it in the context of bio work. One thing I'll say though is there's a shortcut. So one way to do it is what you just said, being like, where's the trunk of science of which this is a branch? Like, what story is this a part of? But I'll just comment that in practice, certainly at least in my own writing, um, there's a concept in journalism called the news peg. And like what that means is like sometimes people are going to be interested in the topic like this week because of something that happened that they already know about. Like the, like for instance, like I was the New York Times ran an article about kind of basic, like some kind of foundational questions in like Bayesianism. That's how I would put it. Or like Bayesian versus frequentist statistics. But really what they were doing is like, oh, they had just ran a big expose about how like two critics of President Trump were like audited by the IRS in a purportedly random audit, like in the same year. And so there was this question like, like is that unlikely, right? So of course the content of the article is like, it's an article about probability. Because like the question, like, what does that question even mean? And but there's a reason they could run that article that week. They couldn't run it some other week. They could run it because on the front page there's this big expose about the IRS, and then it's tied to that. So that's what's called the news peg. And that's actually like often a pretty decent way of thinking about what to write about. Like it's 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 it, it's maybe a little unsatisfying to us because we're like we should like take what's most important and write about that. But like I think you do have to kind of be at a little bit of a sort of faster feedback cycle, like when grab opportunities to write about things when there's something in the news that has energized people's temporary interests. Um, yes. Oh, okay, Sonia can go and then Connell. Oh, you're Connell. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I'm signed with the AI and humanism. Um, so I have a maybe comment on the credential, and I'm wondering what you think about this, like the hyperlinks. If there's a big paper, you just put the hyperlink at least. That's what I've tried to do. But then my major question is just breaking in, because you it sounds from this talk in the following direction, and then I'll send my to the New York Times or Wired, whatever it is, and they'll be, oh, how brilliant. Let's publish it. But it seems like the missing part is how to break in so that people can hear their voice. And um, I'm just wondering about those little steps. Right yes, I do have thoughts about that. It's a really important question. And part of the reason I didn't talk about it is that I'm like almost too old to give good advice about it because I know a lot about how to break in in the 90s and the media landscape has changed so much that that's like almost irrelevant. <laughs> like I'll be advice I used to give people, um, right? It's like, oh, like submit articles to your local free weekly. Like, okay, that's gone, right? <laughs> that used to be a good way to sort of get clips and like, um, I'll say one thing. So Jake mentioned uh, Twitter and other means of social media self-promotion. That's actually a great way. I mean, sort of if you are tweeting about stuff that's like relevant to your science and if you develop a certain following there, I think editors will like see that as like, they call it platform. I'm telling you like all the words that like people in journalism and publishing like to use. They're like, oh, there's an existing platform. Then, okay, there's at least like a thousand people who already decided that they wanted to sort of encounter some words that I wrote. And that, that I think is generally seen as like um, a credential. It's a weird kind of credential, I know, but it's, um, so that's one thing I would say. Um, another thing I would say is that, um, you can use people, like you can use me or like other people who are already in. Like I certainly, for me, like I've talked to people where they're like, I have a specific thing that I want to pitch and I can talk to them about where I think that would go. I did it with like Greg Cooperberry. Mm -hmm. He published a thing about, he published a very salty, cranky quantum thing in Slate, which was because he was like, Jordan, I've got to get out like my anger about D-Wave. And I'm like, okay, this you can run this in Slate, like send it to me and I'll pitch it to the editors. You know what I mean? Like, um, so, I mean, I think this is just getting bigger and bigger. There's like more and more scientists who are writing. And so I feel like whoever is closest to you of course, then, you know, for somebody like me, sometimes I got to say, like, 
no, I don't think that's gonna work. I, I, people, I mean, I gotta be honest, sometimes that's what I, right? I mean, because I feel like at this point, I have a pretty good sense of like what's gonna grab and what's gonna not. But I mean, so that's another way too. Um, and probably, In the old days, I mean, maybe not in the 90s, but in the 2000s, I would have said like, you know, blogging like Scott or Gil or Luca does is like really good. I feel like blogging has like receded a bit. I don't know, maybe you're supposed to like have a Substack or something. Is there like a theoretical CS Substack? Does that exist? I don't even know. So, so okay. So I'm, I'm, so I'm slightly not answering because it's, it, I truly know less about in 2022. Um, but those are, those are some things that I, that I know. But you're right that like, it, it's not just as much as like writing a thing and then like mailing it to the New York Times. I mean, they get thousands and thousands of things every day. And it's like, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, Colin. Uh, thanks. I have, I guess, two questions, observations. The first one, picking up a bit on what the stuff Jake was saying before, we're from very similar academic contexts, i.e. not originally an American context. And I'm interested in, I mean, there's an overall question which to me permeates sort of editing choices and the whole thing, which is what, why, why do this? And it seems like you're working with a model of um, you're conducting scientific research and there's an imperative to share that. There's a sort of public function for that. But as Jake mentioned, there are lots of other reasons people might uh, want to to do this and so i guess i'm interested most of all i mean i've been i've actually never done this but i've thought about it constantly since i observed this massive shift in academia in the uk and australia and so many people really do mostly this in my view and very little <laughs> of what i would call sort of deeper deeper research work past a certain point so i guess i'm mainly interested in young uh people studying in the us and what, how they feel about this, whether this is something they really, they really want to do. Um, or Wait, so there were a lot of, feel they have to. So there was a lot of the word this, and I got a little lost. Are you, uh, are you literally saying that there's a lot of senior academics in Australia who all they're doing is writing op-eds for the paper and they've given up on research and they just like fart out their opinions like all day long for their job? I did not say that. <laughs> um, uh, I was careful not to say that. Okay. Um, so I'm talking about a range of, forms of, let's call them non-academic uh, genres. So we have to distinguish, I think, between genre and a whole lot of other questions, which I think permeate the how. As soon as you've decided to communicate in this way about your research or your area of expertise, there are a whole lot of how questions, which to me is part of my, my second question. I, I, but I mean, we can talk about what that looks like in an environment where we've almost entirely shifted from an authenticity paradigm of, of academia, which I think is still the dominant one in the US, to a profilicity paradigm, right? So I'm using a technical philosophical language about selfhood and identity, but from an authenticity to a profilicity paradigm in the UK, in the, all the neoliberal wash that's come through all these- I'm gonna write down this word so I remember like, mm -hmm. learn it. Profile, this is- it's Profilicity, yeah. So it's, it's not prolificity, it's profilicity. Profilicity, yeah. Oh my God, okay, I gotta learn this word, okay. So, so which is basically saying, um, you're not only what your academic work, you are also what everyone thinks of your academic work. And you might read that as an imperative to make people look at your work more. It's, it's not, but it's it's one of the ways you can establish yourself and one of the ways you can choose to navigate through the academy, right? So in, in an area where that has become a, a kind of dominant paradigm, there's sorts of imperatives, but I guess I'm, I'm interested anthropologically in what's happening in the US because I see it as qualitatively different as an environment from some of these other places. Um, and I guess also ring the warning bell that I feel Jake may have been ringing before as well to say, be careful of too much profilicity in your uh, academic um, identity. Um, yeah, now you've thrown a scare into me because I, I must say you're absolutely right that everything I'm saying is in the context of this is something that not very many academics in the United States are doing. And a lot of people have told me that they want to do, and I think it would be good if there was more of it rather than less. But you're saying there's like a, just another equilibrium. I, I am there. saying that. It sounds terrible. I, I am saying that. that but really, oh, it is. Really. The, the, these are people who are mostly profiling and, and doing less. Okay, that's true. But is Dan Ariely like a typical professor at Duke? Like obviously not, right? He's like the one, how many, how many psychology professors are there at Duke? Probably 50. And there's like one who does that. I don't know. I mean, I'm estimating. 
I can't name any other psychology professors at Duke, which is like my evidence. <laughs> um, There's other interesting sources as well. For instance, when you have something like Google Scholar, which is indexing an unknowable number of non-academic fora mm -hmm. and indices, you can you can get away with producing para-academic work that's still being cited and that satisfying some sort of performance indicator. You know what I'm saying? So like it's not just why, how, also where yeah. and the imperatives behind where. Um, these are all like things that we like learn on the fly as we're going through and uh, and, and and experience ourselves as shaped by these pressures in terms of the outputs we're generating. Um, but we never learned that. You know, no, <laughs> so it's a practice. It's a practice. Yeah, it's a sort of know-how. And you hear it on hiring committees. So Absolutely. Like, you know what? Yeah. Can I say though, I mean, in a way, this conversation is quite bracketed in different sort of uh, spheres of geopolitical spheres. It was true for me as an American who works in America, and like, as you know about America, I'm like, doesn't think comparatively as much as I could. Like, it's very useful for me. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it is. I, a... I tend to talk in a language of like, the way things are is blank. But I should be saying the way things are in U.S. academia. I'm, well. I'm torn though because on the one hand, there's not just uh, the U.S., but it's also different parts of academia, you know, the yeah. CS, and other disciplines. I, I'm torn though because there is this sort of warning that, that there's this other way of doing this that's probably coming if it hasn't already. Um, but also, uh, I think it's about navigating that space, and it could be that a lot of your approach to doing this is a good bulwark against that kind of. Um, it perceived imperative that I don't think is an imperative and doesn't always count in your favor either, by the way. I'm, I've sat on hiring committees where that has counted against people, um, not in a mean way, but in a qualitative intellectual way where they maybe put too much energy into, as, as a junior scholar who hasn't established themselves, which is not what you're saying, but they put a little too much energy into a sort of non-intellectual non space profile building, which means that they just compare less favorably with people who put their energy into really high quality publications early in their career, for example. So anyway, that whole thing's very complex. I've sort of done myself out of my second question by talking too much, and also by this being the more charged question. But I did just want to say one thing about, which I didn't hear you mention very much, but was implicit in what you were saying, around audience. And I think, um, as I've thought very hard about how to, how to start doing this, which I've had to promise to do as part of getting a big grant. There you go. Um, grant and part of that is saying, I will build X profile through X strategies or whatever. Um, but as part of that thinking, it's, it's not just about sort of degree of popular reach, but also qualitatively within that, are you trying to reach a general academic, uh, uh, cut, cut through your field in a way that goes outside your specific area or reach academics at large or reach different sectors of the public too. And I think that's not an abstract question. I think that affects things like editing choices, you know, very much. It starts, I, I blanch slightly when you cut out in your everyday life, for example, in that phrase, because for the right audience at the right place in the in an article, that could be exactly the hook that people, they want to see that word and, and as soon as they see it, they might sort of wake up. Okay, I claim, I don't think they want to see the words in your everyday life, I think they want to see an example that actually reminds them of something in their everyday life and that would be like much more vivid. But maybe, wait, look, maybe. we can disagree about that particular. No, no, this is such, I mean, wow, this stuff is like really great. I'll, I'll just say one thing is that people, You're absolutely right that like audience is not just a number. There's like different audiences that you could hit. And I, I compare. Do you know Danica McKellar? Do you know who she is? No. She was a she was a uh, she had a very interesting life because she was a um, a child actor who was also like a very good uh, math major at UCLA. But instead of going to grad school, decided like continue to pursue. She's an actor today, but she also like writes a bunch of popular math books that are like basically aimed at adolescent girls, like. They're all, they kind of like book like 17 magazine. I'm like, that's that's her thing. That's what comes naturally to her. That's the audience that she knows. That's the audience who's her audience, like as a TV star. Um, so I sort of feel like on some level, it's good that there's a, a lot of different people doing it because people are gonna 
naturally have an audience that they're that they feel more able to speak to. And I think this comes back to you. You're thinking about communicating an idea and selecting the right idea. I mean, I think you select the right idea for that audience and for that forum, right? And that's on you. Uh, it's it's you can't squish the wrong idea into into an audience that. For it's what, well, but people also want to be exposed to stuff they don't expect. I mean, that's part of what writing is all about. I mean, okay, but to speak to this, can I just say to your first thing, since I started with this idea that we were going to borrow ideas that I learned back when I thought I wanted to be a novelist, I do think in that world, how does this play out? Like in the world of people who like try to write short stories and novels and stuff and literary fiction and stuff like that, um, this, I think there's an authenticity discourse there. And I do think that probably, ideally, it's valued in that world. Wait, write the thing that you really have to say that's true to you. And if somebody else was like, oh, this person is just trying to like get more books in print and sell more copies, and they're sort of like doing whatever they think will move copies off the shelf, that would be sort of denigrated, right? So I feel like this, I feel like the idea of writing for a public audience doesn't have to fall sway to valuing profilicity over authenticity, like, and maybe, you know, the community that I used to live in of literary fiction can be something of a model for that. You know, we have tea outside. Oh, it's a tea time, okay. So we could, uh, if you want, stop here and continue the discussion outside. Yes, I'll take all comers, I'm excited. Thanks, thanks a lot, that was really- Thank you guys so much for so many people coming.